if I were able to do one thing uh, in the Dune universe, I would want to climb into the Baron's tub. Um, <laughs> I, I don't know why. I just want to know what it feels like. It, it looks yeah, warm. And, 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 is he in the tub? Uh, yeah. optional? <laughs> optional? Okay. I'm okay. not quite sure. Did also you... now that. <laughs> <laughs> it's clearly got some kind of healing properties. Uh, that's what I think. It must be good for you. You're so right. That bath does look very enticing. But, but I, I, it so does. At any point, did you ever want to get into it or did you even? What was in it? What did he have to sit in? I don't really know what Those it the was. Those should be asking. But I was you. there. I went, that was oh. my first day that I went to set to just watch and take pictures of everyone. It was, and I, I was like, didn't uh, I didn't touch it. You didn't touch it? I, I, I wouldn't be able it. to resist. I was just, I'm going to leave he, that, well, whatever that is. When he comes up, he, there. He, he's covered in it? Yeah. The black mm -hmm. kind of oil. Like an apocalypse now type thing. Yeah. And I go, it's pretty sweet. I had absolutely zero desire <laughs> to climb into that black gooey mess. <laughs> it, it was cool, but I, you know, for some reason now I didn't have the desire to get in there. But visually, I mean, stunning. It doesn't get, I mean, to think about the scene of him rising out of that black goo, I mean, you know, that's a scene that's going to be seen a lot throughout the years. Yeah. Visually, just incredible. Yeah, it's true that uh, it, they are a very sophisticated uh, uh, society, uh, uh, culture, and they are like very. I always envision that the the Baron will be uh, more comfortable in liquid because of his weight, and 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 I always love this idea that it's not in the book. I think it's a, it's more an idea that I came with that to to feel that. Uh, and still in the embrace the idea, like I'm looking. It is warm, it is syrupy, uh, it's a sort of, it's oily too, so it's, it's not, you, you, and you don't know what's in it. You don't know what chemicals have in it. It's something uh, really special, but uh, a little worrying. <laughs> what's the, what is the longest that Denis kept you in there? Well, I, I mean, I, I was in there for half a day. Okay. Okay, not too bad. Uh, yeah, I wasn't underwater all the time. Right, <laughs> that's good to know. Stellan says it's uh, oily and scary. Wow. It's, it is very oily. I'll take yeah. his word for it yeah. at this point. <laughs> I think it was from Apocalypse Now was the inspiration for yeah. that. Did you get a chance to do anything like really cool out of character like that on the set? You mean like do a, do an ice bath with the Baron? That could be one, sure. Yeah, no, you do love the ice bath. I baths. do, I do no, love the ice baths. But no, I mean, what he did was amazing. It was so ominous. It was like watching Brando on Apocalypse Now. But no, I didn't get to do. What, what did I do? I found my ice bath wherever I was. Ooh, there you the are. Middle East. <laughs> I found it from a prince. A prince turned me on to an ice bath. Really? That's right. Yeah, we met out. a prince. Yeah. We met a prince that Denis was like, we, we, I'm going to give this prince the Chris knife and I'm going to do a whole thing. The helicopters came down. The guys came out security and all that yeah. and then the guy turned the I didn't want to stay but my friend Denis and all this and I was like okay and he came around the corner and he goes dude the prince did and I was like no way what's up we talked about the stoics we talked about ice baths we talked about body mass it was fun um, I don't think people are going to give you guys enough credit for the amount of physicality you have to do in the sand. Right. If I'm on a vacation and I make it 10 minutes across the beach, I'm throwing all of our shit down <laughs> yeah. and I'm like we're here for the day. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, can you just talk about like overcoming that like getting up enough energy to maintain that i don't know about overcoming but i but i but i i so appreciate the sentiment because if anything was physically sort of affirming and rejuvenating because uh uh it's just it's it's great i don't want to be like facetious in saying that when you can go home as an actor and feel like you left it on the field yeah. whether it's simply a day sand walking across the desert or there's those long shots of paul i don't want to give anything away but literally where they would put me in a jeep well we would have to helicopter to a location in jordan that had been shot before and they put me in a jeep a 20 minute ride in the distance and then with a little thing in my ear like just walk towards the distance not seeing really? where the camera was because it was oh, so wow. far and just getting the left left right right just wow. kind of veering you know shot yeah, i'm talking yeah, about yeah. where it's really at a distance absolutely um and wow. uh yeah it was good for the spirit to, to work in the sand that much it, it is but like a yeah. sound stage and green screen is is okay yeah, <laughs> yeah i know but but um yeah no element of this film was thrown the towel in. It was cool. No. Yeah, yeah. Can you talk about the physicality of like overcoming that? Like just doing normal stuff, but yeah. doing it on sand. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, it's um, I got some good calf definition going. You know, <laughs> you like firing pictures? off of the glutes. <laughs> um, 
Uh, I had come previously from a tennis film, so I was happy that I was already oh, kind of in yeah. somewhat of a shape. So, right. so it helped out with that. Um, but yeah, no, I mean, it. honestly, my part is easy. It's, it's, there's equipment, camera equipment, and like, you know, pr the production has to happen. Yeah. And so I think that I'm really impressed by, I think, by the crew and how they, you know, they're carrying cameras on their shoulders or Apple boxes and, and, and rigs and setups and all these kinds of things. Yeah. And they're all, you know, happy to be there and, and doing the best work possible. Timothy uh, and the uh, evolution of, of Paul, where you see him from his first day shooting Dune Part 1 to, to where he was on the last day of Dune Part 2? Oh, uh, it's uh, uh, it was very moving for me. I will, I will more specifically, on, on part one, I was telling the story of a boy discovering a world, and I was w witnessing Timothy walking on set, discovering. Uh, 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 it was the first time he was working uh, on a movie of that scale and trying to find his bearing, trying to find his place, uh, trying to protect his creative space, learning. He was in a learning mode. And when he came on set on part two, it was a, it was a different thing. He, he was a leading uh, man. He became, and the, the curve, the dramatic curve of Paul, uh, at the beginning of part two, Paul is still a boy, but became a, a, a man, became a dark figure, being a charismatic leader. And to see that transformation in front of the camera was very moving for me. 27 back in the day is not 27 now. We felt older back then at 27. I had kids at 20 and 25. You know, I, I look at 20 year olds now and maybe just cause I'm older and I go like, I can't even imagine you having a child. <laughs> the thing with Timothy is he came into this so young, you know, he was coming to terms with his maturity and the fact that he's doing this big movie and Denis Villeneuve and all that. So it strangely paralleled what was going on in the movie, you know, right, and then right. to see this in this movie, watch him actually mature and beyond anything that Gurney could ever imagine for him. You young pup. Talk to me a bit about the evolution of Denis. I mean, it, it, even with these Dune movies, it feels like his audience is growing and people are going back and looking at his older films. Um, just from working with him earlier, what have you seen uh, from his progress as a storyteller? Oh man, that's a question that's way over my head. <laughs> um, you know, I never thought about that, and I can't speak to his uh, his evolution as a storyteller because I think he's always been a brilliant storyteller. Sure. I just think that he's been giving opportunities to tell bigger stories, more epic stories. Um, but I think his brilliance was recognized early with his smaller films, mm -hmm. and I think it does. I love that you use that storytelling because it boils down to that. Right. Big stories uh, feel like there would be no-brainers, they're going to be easy hits, but they've somehow missed the mark. Yeah. And I think uh, it was such a task for us, for Denny, to take on such a challenge to tell the story of Dune, mm -hmm. uh, the novel, when I, which I think he's been obsessed with his whole life of doing. And to actually be able to nail it <laughs> yeah. was uh, quite an accomplishment. And I think, uh, and that's kind of what I'm excited about, because I think the fans, more than anything, and I, there's going to be people that aren't fans of the novels. But the true diehard fans, the people who grew up obsessed with these novels, mm -hmm. are going to be, I think they're going to be so happy that he did these novels justice and was able to bring these kind of visuals and, you know, take this story and put it on the screen and not really miss a beat. I think that what he accomplished was was incredible. There's no tension on the, on the set. Mm -hmm. He is so calm, it's so quiet. Everybody, everybody is an expert at what they do. Mm -hmm. Everybody is very well skilled. And that he he manages on, on such a big film. He is playful. He uh, he, uh, he he creates on the set. He, he doesn't sort of fill out the blanks that he's that he's um, of something that is created at home. Okay. He, he he really creates there, and he sees things. He notices things, and he invents things, and it's going on. And. Uh, uh, that feels, uh, that me me means that you feel that you're a part of a creative process. That's what I was going to ask, is he open to feedback from, yeah. from the actors? Yeah, he is. Yeah, he you is. can give him notes. Yes. At least you, he gives you that impression. Right. <laughs> <laughs> you are not prepared for what is to come. Um, there's a line that I had to write down and it said, uh, Father, I found my way. Mm -hmm. uh, as Paul talking with uh, Oscar's character. And I'm mm -hmm. curious what um, influence Oscar's performance and your collaboration with him on that first one still sort of hung over you in this one. 
Uh, wow. I mean, just, uh, what a great question. All of it. You know, he was such a commanding presence on set. Oscar was equally playful. He, he felt like Duke Leto to me. You know, he felt like a, um, a strong man who was, uh, uh, in the acting world, not, uh, rendered, um, less powerful by his, by his humanity and his moral compass. But in the realm of the movie, I felt it was very palpable that Duke Leto's a, a human figure and that thus makes him sort of vulnerable to these psychopathic figures like the Baron or, or the Emperor. Yeah. Um, so he was really in my, in my spirit and my performance. Well, you know, I hadn't seen Oscar in so long, you know, and right, right. it was so strange to continue to tell a story and work on a film without some of the crucial elements to the first one. Were you able to bring your bike over? My motorcycle? Yeah. No. During during the shoot? No, but I have a friend, <laughs> Mr. Momoa, yeah. who has motorcycles all over the fucking world now. <laughs> okay. So I, I there was a movie I was looking at doing that I thought was going to be in New Zealand. He's in New Zealand. And he was like, I got three bikes over there. I was like, great. I'll do the movie. <laughs> um, <laughs> That's what drives you. <laughs> Austin, I'm curious, watching the film last night, it strikes me still that like decades later, this material is still so relevant and, and topical. Um, and I'm curious what theme stands out to you as, as being one that even shocks you that to this day, it's still a topic of conversation that we're having. I, I think it's it's ultimately such an examination of power and, and of, of, of um, I mean, politically, you know, that's, uh, I didn't see that as a kid when I was reading the book, mm -hmm. you know, I didn't, I didn't think about how that related to the world and and uh, and and the climate and to all these mm -hmm. you know uh, all these elements that I feel like Frank Herbert was in a way so far ahead of his time in, in examining these these themes. Um, but really, really power power mm -hmm. dynamics I, I think is is such a universal thing. I don't know which specific theme, but I do think like <laughs> there's something to be said with humans don't learn. Yeah, we don't. Right. And, um, and no matter how empathetic we all are and understanding we all are, um, people's motives get in the way mm -hmm. and they have to because in their journey and in their story, they are doing what's right and they are doing what they believe is the correct decision. Like I remember a few weeks ago, we were talking about Austin uh, and playing Fade Rother and he was like, yeah, but to him, he's like, he's doing the right thing. He's, mm -hmm. he's this... He's he's there. He's got his uncle's approval, and and I suppose like to me, uh, we've just been talking all morning about how every single one of these characters has their own world and their own issues and their own um, their own stories that they're battling, and it's exactly like you know what we humans go through. We we never stop to think about the others that we are inflicting. Yeah. Um, so I guess that to me is the one thing that I really kind of. Yeah, we're not, we don't learn. You know, I, I guess it's it's always going to be relevant because I think there's always going to be a struggle uh, between good and evil. It's never, it's a story that's going to be with us forever because there's, it's just, I think um, that is the nature of, of, of the human being. I think there's good nature and there's a bad nature and there's always going to be a struggle. And I think there's going to be people that, you know, gravitate more towards being just bad people. But you know, bad people never see themselves as bad people. <laughs> so I think it's always going to be kind of the difference in the perspective of people and human beings. And I think it's just you know, again, this is uh, always going to be. It's always going to be um, with us. I mean, as long as we exist, you know, it's, it's good and evil. It's mm -hmm. God and the devil. It's just something that's with us, and it's always going to. It's always a good story to tell, but it's always kind of heartbreaking to think that we're still struggling with this in some. Sometimes where it feels like uh, we're not living in the brightest of times, we're kind of living in dark times. It's a scary thing, yeah. you know, and it's uh, maybe a premonition, but I think it's more than that. It's just been something we've uh, kind of has been with us from the beginning of time, right. you know, beginning of man. So good versus evil. He who can destroy a thing has the real control of it.